Okay, so here we are. Let us start with mantra. Om Vang Me Manasi Pratishtheta Mano Me Vachi Pratishthetam Avira Virma Edhi Vedasyama Anistaha Shrutam Me Ma Prahasihi Anena Dhite Na Horatran Samdadhami Ritam Vadishyami Satyam Vadishyami Tanmam Avatu Tadvaktaram Avatu Avatumam Avatu Vaktaram Avatu Vaktaram Om Shanti 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 We are in the verse 8. Tavadyumanto archayo graveva uchyate brehat utote tan yatuhyatha svano arta tmanadivach. We, I think we read it. Mm. Luminous are thy flaming radiances. There rises from thee a vast utterance like the voice of the pressing stone of delight, and thy cry of itself rises like the thunder chant from the heavens. And the cry of itself, that's kind of uh, interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's, a, it's got some kind of sound of self-referral. Yeah, tmana. Tmana is the word. Tman means the, the same as Atman later. In the Rigveda, Atman and Tman are never used for the sake uh, to indicate, to denote the, the spirit or the self in the spiritual sense. It is always the self as such. Uh, it may be body, it may be vital body, mental body, any body any self, and so by itself, sounding by itself. Well, but in this context, it couldn't possibly be vital or anything lower like that. Well, in the Vedas, there is no such view. <laughs> oh, God. Well, it's our mind in the post-Vedic which created this kind of separation of the spirit and matter. In the Veda, it's, uh, Atman is the self. You see, if you look at uh, the physical being from the point of view of the Vedic spiritual look, it is that embodiment of the spirit. Oh, right. okay. So there is, uh, if I say Atman as a self, as the body, it means that everything else is implied. It's there, present. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The Veda, uh, yeah, the Veda is so absolutely all, all inclusive and all comprehensive in its, its view of individual life mm -hmm. and the pur the purpose of it. It's, it's. You're right. It's very easy to start. Um, Distinguishing, yes. Well, compartmentalizing things. Right. Well, it's it would be good to do when when it is, yeah, when it is explaining something or giving us a deeper understanding, because our mind works like this. It wants to know things in detail, so we have to do it. But in this case, self. Self is an excellent word, by the way, in English, which you don't find in other languages. In Russian, there is no self. So um, it's very difficult to say. In English, even uh, he speaks to himself, or he, uh, he, uh, I sing to myself. The self is actually that which makes all meaning. Yeah? So to which self do I sing, actually? To, to mm -hmm. sing to myself. So I have me and myself. Some creation, some... Um, 
being, yeah, being to which I sing, and it is my being. That's quite unique what language it does. Language is that the same thing as Atmane Pada? Yeah. Yes, Atmane, it's Atmane to oneself, Padam, word. Word so to Atman, word. to you oneself. Don't in, you don't need the word in Russian because it's implied in other grammatical structures. But once you have this separate word in English, then you... No, we have the word, but I can't use it in that very sense. Sam, Sida. So to say, we have this xia su uh, suffix, which is always used like, uh, you know, um, which makes it uh, this atmanepadam, yes? Xia, but isn't that, that's the same thing as fa? Sibya, sibya means uh, oneself. Hmm. Uh, okay, so we read this before, I guess. And the last verse is evam agnim vasu yavach sahasanam vavandima sanovishva atidvishach parshan naveva sukratuch. Did we read this? I have a deja vu feeling. We started it last time. We did. Okay, we finished. ta -da, Let's go straight to the new one. 26. Vasuya Atreya, so Gayatri, there will be nine Gayatri verses dedicated to Agni and the last one to Vishvedevas. Um, but he's called Vasu, Vasu, so he's, uh, or it's a family, the, the Atris. Vasuyu. Vasuyu is, um, uh, the one who seeks Vasu, who is looking for the luminous dweller within. But he's found it, obviously. If he's a Rishi, then he's obviously located it. I, with this finding and looking, I think it's also very Vedic to say that um, constant looking is required. Even if you found it, if you're not looking, you will lose it. Yeah? So you need to constantly do this looking, even if you already know where it is and what it is. And even if you have it, you have to still look for it. Oh, it's kind of, that's kind of what we were starting with when we were talking about long marriage. It, you can be married, but unless you keep, you know, remarrying in a sense, yeah. re, reinvigorating the relationship, then it it it's no longer a vital relationship. So it's kind of like that same thing of just re-enlivening, re mm -hmm. uh, reaffirming, re-experiencing that yeah. which you already are. Yeah, because we live in time and space. So every moment is passing. So if I found it in this moment, the next moment I have to find it again. So I have to keep it, so to say. To keep it means, in this case, to find it again, to look for it again and again, to have that consciousness aspiring for it, looking for it. And that is the first verse of the Veda. Agnimile, ide, this de id is to seek with adoration. I seek Agni with adoration. Why? I found it already. Vishwamitra, uh, I mean the Madhuchanda of uh, the, the grandson of Vishwamitra definitely found Agni. And still, he says, uh, I seek him with adoration. Yeah, the one who leads uh, in front, who is the God of uh, all transformation who is uh, knower of all the seasons, all the, the order of, of transformation, what is first and what is next in time. The one who invokes summoner of the gods, of the divine powers, who is bestower of the greatest riches. So, and the next verse is even more interesting. Agni furve bih rishi bih idiach nuta So Agni, is to be sought with adoration, idiach, is to be sought. Uh, 
by the first rishis and the modern ones. Well, it seems like that one of the things we know from physics is that creation is constantly dissolving and recreating in every nanosecond. And it does it automatically kind of that dissolving and then re, um, re-manifesting. And so, refreshing, rebooting, yeah? <laughs> well, and so, I mean, the truth is we don't have to do anything for that to happen, but we do have to be conscious of right. our existence in order to be conscious. We have to be conscious of the existence of that in order to be conscious of the divine. Yeah, it's something interesting. I don't know that physics knows this knowledge because I'm surprised that you say this. It's Mother who says that from the trans, uh, from the supramental point of view, the world is being created and dissolving, in being dissolved every moment. So it is recreated every moment. That pulse of creation is there, which we don't see here. We see he has uninterrupted flow of things. Like my body is the same body one minute ago, and it's not the same body. I just don't see it. I don't really. I'm not aware of it being reassembled. In uh, so well, we've recreated it out of our vasanas, I guess, yeah. out of our need for continuity. But I mean, if we weren't strapped to that, we could recreate a divine body in the next moment. Yeah, I mean, or a divine consciousness. But mm-hmm. otherwise, you know, that's the whole point of evolution mm. is to be able to next moment create something more divine right that's why evolution is taking place because it's possible to really readjust readjust constantly and it is it, it, there is as you rightly say there's some kind of vasanas which are dragging us down so to say inertia or the habit repetitive uh, kind of what we call skills, skill as as repetition of the functions in a particular form, which is dragging us to this particular um, uh, template, which we must work out, template of being young, old and dying. So this template, it's a habit rather. Somewhere mother says that the death is a habit, actually. It's not really the truth of our being. But if we didn't die, um, I mean, there's so many other parts of the universe that get created and nourished by our dying. I, it's, you know, it's, it seems like it's part of our being, our, our co-creation of the whole picture. For Right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe... That's just my kind of feeling about it. Well, definitely, that's uh, the divine economy. It's arranged in such a way that our dying would not be in vain. It should be useful to the universe in some way or another. Our material, our uh, organic material becomes the gas, biogas, and uh, oil, and that oil is now used <laughs> over billions of millions of years. We pump oil and start using it. That oil is organic matter. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm not even talking about matter. I'm talking about, you know, the devas. Don't they profit by our demise as well? The petris and the uh, other uh, and agni and all these other devas also uh, are nourished as oh, yeah. well. Yes, every, everything in divine economy, everything finds its outcome, its place to be used. It's really well, it's like nature arranged everything. If you look at nature, how beautiful it is arranged. There is a rain, there is a grass, there are animals, animals eating animals, insects are working on, on plants. Everything is working in nature, everything nourishing everybody so it's so wonderfully arranged and it can go on and on and of course species are dying out and they are coming back and uh, they are being born and they are dying out and it's this kind of constant perpetual death is life yeah constant life in time 
Um, and there is this economy, there is this wisdom behind uh, of, the, of the immortal being. What I'm saying is that um, the habit to do so is like billions of years. Yeah? And this billions of years habit is very difficult to change. It's a groove, but it is a habit still. Because those creatures who are in born, born now, they may have rights to stay forever, but they can't because there is this groove established. Yeah, We are following the same pattern. We inherited the same burden, the same fears, thoughts, ideas about ourselves and the world. We don't even think that we can stay forever. We can't even imagine because everything what we learned, yeah, we learned from this um, inheritance we got. But this inheritance is a habit. It's a long-standing habit, yes. So if we would be free from that habit, we could have a choice to do something different, yeah? But, we but are I not. mean, even Aitreya and I mean, even they who wanted, I mean, and, 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 and intended to and thought about staying forever, even they didn't. Achieve. Definitely, because well, they are not different from this groove. They, we are talking about the physical body. Staying means physical body. Otherwise, of course, there is no, no question. You can stay, you can create a vital immortal body or mental immortal body and stay there in that body. You don't need, but we are talking about this physicality, which is unthinkable to even. But in the Vedas we find this idea of immortality only in the Vedas. From the Ved maybe in some Upanishads like Shvetashvatara one or, or Katha Upanishad one like and Isha. These three Upanishads where this understanding of immortality in the wider sense in the Vedic can be found or kind of interpreted. There is nothing in Brahmanas, nothing in Aranyakas and from that time on, immortality is always uh, a asmat lokat pretya, having gone from this world, become immortals. So we always have to drop body to become immortals. But again, it's not immortality, because immortality is a, is a relative term. It means that mortality in time and space, you have to be immortal. If there is no mortality, immortality is irrelevant because I am joining the spirit which is, which is always, which is eternal, infinite. It's not immortality. Oh, is that what you mean by mental immortality? Mental immortality is a unique thing. Actually, some rishis mo most probably have it. Um, and vital immortality. Your mental body, you create as immortal body. Mother did this, and she explains what it is. You can really create the mental, your mental identity body, which remembers, which knows concepts, thoughts, ideas, um, has memory and so on, can become so much purified and so much under influence of the, your soul, which will be psychicized, and your spirit, higher, uh, universal spirit, forces of the divine, uh, these uh, gods, you know, the divine powers, that it becomes luminous and can sustain itself after death. You don't need to dissolve your mental being into the mental realm, which we usually do. When we die, we dissolve our physical, vital and mental bodies. They go into the reservoir, our thoughts, our, they become part of the, you know, bigger nature, which we can reassemble later if you want to, or somebody else can use them with the same need, yeah, these thoughts. It's like fish in the water. So we give everything to the water. But you can make individualized formation of infinite or immortal mental being, which will sustain from death to, from life to life. If you come to life, you call your mental being and it comes back to you with all these equipment and all the tools. And that is quite interesting. And even your vital body you can create, but not physical. Physical somehow cannot sustain this spirit. It has to go. Um, 
<laughs> it's very entertaining. Yeah. Yeah, to think about this. And it, it sounds totally true to me. I can feel this can be true because it, how else it could be, you know? Why we are here at all if we are not doing this? If we don't want to get that formation which would be luminous, full of power and consciousness, totally harmonized with the, re, with the truth. So what are we doing then here? Just passing some kind of flares, like, you know, without any reason? going and coming and going with no reason so it doesn't make sense right uh, okay a hymn of a, the priest and sacrificial flame the rishi invokes the divine flame in all its usual attributes as the sacrificer the luminous seer who has the vision of the luminous world the bringer of the gods the bringer of the gods, the carrier of the offering, the envoy, and the conqueror, increaser of the divine workings in man, the knower of the births, the leader of the march of the sacrifice, march of the sacrifice, also interesting. Yeah, it, let's talk about that. Yeah. Anyway. With, it, with its progressive epiphany of the godheads progressive epiphany of the godheads. Um, you see, I was meditating a few days back and I got a new idea about Agni. When I was chanting Agni hymns, I thought, I saw or felt or knew that Agni is not a god. <laughs> there are gods which he brings yeah he's the bringer of the gods but he's more than gods he's more than divine powers it's not just the power of the divine it's like it's difficult to it's a will it's the will of the supreme and the will of the supreme brings all kind of divine powers into play to manifest uh, the new being to manifest himself uh, so he cannot be considered to be one of the gods. So in the Rig Veda, Agni is the god. No. That's why he is first. The first hymn, every, every mandala starts with the hymns to Agni. Because he is to summon, to bring the divine powers into action. So he's like, he's like um, a divine intelligence, but an active divine intelligence. Not a... Not a mm. kind of heavenly or transcendental divine intelligence. He's an active intelligence that is embedded uh -huh. into the, the the very fabric and the nature of right life so, of existence itself. Absolutely, yes. He is that active intelligence, immortal among, among mortals, which gods are not. Yeah? So he has to bring those immortal beings into action, but he is already there. He always shines there in the darkness. He, he is not the God. He is something more than gods. He is the duta. He is the envoy, the messenger of the gods. They sent him there for themselves to be called and to enter into this play of forces. But the gods have certain kind of restrictions and mm. and portfolios and certain mm. and and Agni is just bigger than all of it. He, right. he has more power, more will, more consciousness, more mm -hmm. everything than that. That he's not restricted by a particular mm. uh, a set of. Uh, capacities right and that's why you n never find agni as a god in puranas you will never find agni a kind of personalized as a god like somebody comes with a body talks agni never does it it is something more than that um, but he's in all of them anyway he's, yes he is all he underlies them all all right Right. To me, I, when when I when I look at this, is Agni is always first, and the um, 
uh, when if, from what we know of the the long history of our uh, of our ancestors as they changed from primates uh, it's been a very long time that fire was in use probably fire came before speech mm -hmm. and uh, so my 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 insight is that the awareness of divine uh, happened around fire Mm -hmm. An and anthropological. If, uh, yeah, and if you look at the um, if you look at the um, the Indo-European heritage, uh, we have, you know, in Greek, Roman, um, uh, Vedic, we have Hestia, we have Gesta, we have Vesta. They were all the oldest, the the eldest uh, female who kept the kept the flame. Mm -hmm. Okay, and which of course is only one lineage from even more ancient. Yeah, and Prometheus actually stole the flame from the gods and brought it down to be people. This is also very interesting, the, the divine origin of the flame. And um, when he brought them down, so that's why he suffered from it. But uh, yes, the origin, the divine origin of the flame, which was given to people, that, that means they started to worship the divine. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Mm. Agni and the, the worshiping the divinity came together at the same time. And really, also cooked food also, yes, and everything else, yes. Warmth. I really appreciate your insight there, Vladimir. I thought mm. that was quite brilliant, mm -hmm. quite luminous. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Lynn, also to sharing this thought. It's an interesting thought that with Agni, we have the divinity uh, starting the religion, starting to, uh, human beings started to become conscious of some other, uh, how to say, presence in them, con consciousness in them, which is beyond nature, beyond immediate perception. Mm -hmm. There was a reflection of some kind of their origin. Okay, uh, so first verse Agne Pavakash Rochisha Mandraya Deva Jihvaya Adevan Vakshi Yakshicha. Oh, immediately, Vakshi Yakshicha from the first verse. Uh, o flame, O purifier, bring to us Vakshi. Uh, by the tongue of rapture, Mandraya Jihvaya, O God Deva, the gods Devan, and offer to them sacrifice, Yakshicha. Uh, Shubindu says to them, because it's, a, it's a, a customary thing to say to them sacrifice offer, but literally and sacrifice. Bring them here and sacrifice, literally. So, because he will be sacrificing the gods here. He will introduce them into this uh, lower hemisphere and will make use of them. He will illumine our darker hemisphere with their presence, bring some new faculties, new qualities, new values with them. But isn't it, isn't it co-creative? I mean, isn't it kind of commercial where is the gods sacrifice themselves or they 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 sacrifice and they and then creation sacrifices to them i mean isn't it a right. two way Yes, we were talking about this. Yes, it's two ways, and there is a reason for this. But what when you said whether they sacrifice themselves, and it's quite interesting, they don't sacrifice themselves. Agni sacrifices them. Yeah. So Agni here is that summoner and the priest of the sacrifice who sacrifices the gods here. Uh, and they obey him because he is the divine will in them. Yeah, they cannot really avoid them, him, his command. They must, re, re, because that is the very nature of their own luminous nature. But it wouldn't be set up that way if they didn't get something for it. Yes, definitely. When, when, once they do the sacrifice and come down to our aspiration, our elements in us, which do not know how to sacrifice, our darker elements, selfish elements, which are built from this 
from this fallen nature of the first uh, Asuras as the elder brothers of the gods, that what we constitute here in this world, physical nature, vital desires, egoistic nature, mental dogmas and formations, all of them are seeing this, what is happening, experiencing it partially, are learning from this sacrifice how to give themselves back to the light, to the divine. And they, that's the offering we do. We offer some part of our uh, darker nature, unregenerated nature to this light, to Agni, to carry it to the gods as our offering. Um, and that is also calling them for action here. It's a, it's a unique double movement. As in the Gita, Krishna says, so the gods and man he created together with sacrifice and by the sacrifice the man supports gods and the gods supported by the sacrifice of man support man. And by this mutual support you move towards higher good, both of you, gods and man. But there's something about, so let me ask you then about that that mutual thing. Because so in in the, there's, uh, there's that which you just described happens automatically. Man just automatically sacrifices and to the gods by, I mean, they, and then there's the choice to do it. And then there's the. I, I don't understand word automatically here. It's, it's the only thing which is not happening automatically. Because that, that's why we have to always seek Agni, always apply consciousness, always do that, seek with the duration, look for it, even if it is there. If we don't do it, it doesn't happen automatically. It's not something we are, uh, how to say, we will get, we will fall, we may fall back from this higher consciousness. Even if we are higher, if we stop doing it, believing that everything is done for us, and we don't have to do anything, slowly we will fall back and become but the less gods, and less. The, the gods partake of human life on our right. life, all life on earth, right. whether, whether we sacrifice or not. That's the point I was making is that, right? Isn't that the case that they, they. After they, our death, yes. Um, not until then. Okay. Well, uh, until then also there are dealings going on all the time, consciously yeah. or unconsciously. I, I want this, so I would invoke somebody in some way, yes, some force power, which is maybe partially the divine power of the particular nature we, to help me out in this situation. So I promise to that power, consciously or unconsciously, certain exchange with my own energy. So we are constantly, we're doing this with people, with other creatures, with, with the invisible beings, gods and paishachas and asuras and rakshasas and, and all kind of creatures are behind which, with whom we are constantly doing this exchange. Or Petris, we remember our forefathers, our nation, our whatever. Yeah? We are constantly doing, we are calling for a bigger setup, bigger context in which we would feel at home and interact with those forces. But so Agni, Agni isn't brokering that as well? Um, Agni's, hmm. Agni's is something in us which is, um, it's like a, when it is not conscious energy, for example, conscious means we do not apply mantra to this aspiration in nature. Aspiration in nature is available everywhere. Every being on earth or in the world tries to improve itself. So it is that's what I guess what I meant by automatically. Okay. Okay. But if it is Con consciously perceived and sought with adoration through the word. Word is the formation of intention to direct it towards some realization or high realization of oneself. It becomes very effective and it doesn't require any more billions of years to do it. Otherwise, 
within on the timeline of uh, the nature we in maybe in some billion years we would arrive at it whether we want it or not in our minds yes because something within the nature works nature does uh, yoga for us she aspires to be loved by Purusha she wants to be wanted by him she wants to be <laughs> accepted appreciated by him so she will be trying her best uh, and in that sense we will slowly uh, grow uh, but there are limitations of species hmm. okay it's a complex issue yeah? uh, species are limited uh, for example animals they can develop to a certain extent and then they don't develop they don't grow in consciousness they need some interference from somewhere for example human beings became a huge interference for animals many of them become unconscious like dogs and cats who are live, living close with man they're really getting consciousness which is absolutely unusual for for this for this type of species and most probably their spark within in the next uh, reincarnation would like to be born in this human body and leave that that formation of those species behind I think it is happening uh, to many that's why there are so many human beings they're all coming from animal kingdom so the species disappear slowly you know we kill species 2,000 a year disappear totally from the um, face of the earth we erase them and where do they go <laughs> they go into the human kingdom I'm joking yeah, one of them is our president right now <laughs> right anyhow this is a big topic and beautiful about species and the evolution from one formation to another once you work out all the animal relations faculties of consciousness and you need more then you are looking for another type and if nature didn't build that type nature will build she will organize it in such a way that the human beings will come into existence and now human, but then being, human beings have all these different levels and all these different layers right. it's of quite humanity yes. Yes. as well and then once you get to human then Agni starts brokering that increasingly according to your intention to to aspire to seek with adoration this is the good point where uh, yes lynn was suggesting that agni started a conscious life for man and uh, from that time on we have a human being who is consciously could choose something which is not visible in nature the divine presence the powers which are behind and um, and now this agni can lead us even more towards some new species which will emerge in the future some uh, you know higher species with the intuitive mind and um, and capacities of uh, inspiration okay here we are or oh, agni or oh, purifier with your luminous and blissful tongue bring here and sacrifice here to the gods I can remove two or I can put it into the brackets. Oops. Is Pavaka the same as Pavamana? Yes, Pavaka is uh, purifying, Pavamana is, yes, also purifying for oneself. Mm, it's Vayu Pavamana usually. Vayu is the purifier. Uh, uh, Avayu is one of the Agnis in the vital world, by the way. The means of the sacrifice and the manner in which it is done should be both in the instrumental case. Here I'm looking for this, which I already explained. I will not read it. We don't need it. Okay. These are beautiful portions of, uh, of uh, Savitri, which uh, I found for, suitable for this portion. That would be fun. Let's let's read those. The absolute, the perfect, the immune, one 
who is in us as our secret self, that hidden self within us. Our mask of imperfection has assumed. He has made this tenement of flesh his own. His image in the human measure cast that to his divine measure we might rise. Then, in a figure of divinity, the Maker shall recast us and impose a plan of Godhead on the mortal's mold, lifting our finite minds to his infinite, touching the moment with eternity. This transfiguration is Earth's due to heaven. The mutual debt binds man to the Supreme. His nature we must put on as he puts ours. This is that, you know, when we see, with our unregenerated nature sees that what he does to us sacrifices his higher consciousness for us, we want to put his, so we offer ourselves to him. We are sons of God and must be even as he. His human portion, we must grow divine. Our life is a paradox with God for key. That's got a very Christian kind of flame to it, a flavor to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we notice this, that the Vedic, many times, especially with the Agni, has something to do with Christian um, kind of son and father. Here you can see again this uh, Christian, for, yeah? The son of God born as the son of man. Well, it's also got this kind of man is made in the image of God. Um, kind of right, you know. absolutely, absolutely. Well, yeah. we have to remember the time and place that uh, that um, Sri Aurobindo was writing uh, in uh, the highly educated uh, uh, Indian who uh, was brought up through the British education system of having to put up with the Raj, having to put up with the uh, colonial missionaries. Uh, and all uh, the poetry and literature and Shakespeare well, and everything. Yeah. And, and, and those great gifts from that, but also um, also uh, a desire to uh, to take that vocabulary and put it into a context that made sense in yeah. India. Yeah, well, somebody did this work with Savitri and they found many passages like this. This is totally Christian here, yes? You can mm -hmm. see that uh, each son, soul is the great father's crucified son. Look at this beautiful mm -hmm. line. And this was my discovery that I understood why Jesus says that he is the only son of God. Because it is actually the presence of the father in the heart, yeah? That's why he says, I'm in the heart of every man. And so that's why the only son of God, that means that soul within us is the only child of God. Yeah. There is no other what? direct child. There are many formations, many tools, many instruments, a body and that and this and feelings and emotions and thoughts. Yes, they are not children of God. The child direct is here in the heart, that spark of Agni. So, okay, we can look into the next verse. Tvam tam tva gritas nav imahe. It is gritas no imahe. Chitrabhano suvardrisham devan a vita yevaha. This is also very interesting. In Vita, yeah, this word. Um, thou who drippest with clarity, Gritasno. That's the gri, the, the ghi. G yes, ghi. He drips ghi everywhere. So he's kind of overflowing with clarity and warmth and this luminous golden color. Yeah? Because ghi is warmth. It is uh, a color, golden, and it is also um, 
fat shining yeah? nourishing nourishing also right so you drippest with a clarity thou of the rich and varied luminousness chitrabhano we desire thee chitra hmm? chitrabhanu bhanu is the light or luminous and chitra is varied light usually it's translated as varied but i think Spark it, it, sparkling it, Yes, I think it is deeper because Chitra in the post-Vedic uh, means always this varied light, all colored, many colors mixed up. Mm, and from here, Chitra picture. Yeah? Uh, but I think it is from root Chit, full of light of consciousness. Consciousness, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. So you are luminous with, with consciousness. We desire thee because thou hast the vision of our world of the truth. Suvardrisham. Bring to us the, God, the gods for their, for their manifesting. Oh, their manifesting. Yeah, this is... Yeah. So you're bringing the gods. I mean, it's not like saying bring the gods for us. It's bring the gods for them. Yes, for their manifestation. For the, their their work. Yeah. So, or for the journeying, vita ye, of the luminous world of, of, to the luminous world of the truth, for the eating also of the oblations. So, vita ye, viti. We can look into here, into the, uh, here it is. Enjoyment, feast, and full draught, separation, V from root V to approach, to seek eagerly, to grasp, to seize, to enjoy, even to attack, to assail, to visit, to punish, to avenge, to arouse, to excite, to impel, <laughs> to further, to promote, to lead, to bring, to help uh, anyone to something. Yeah? to get, to procure. And this is quite interesting because it is for yeah. progress, for moving forward. And that's why he says for their manifestation, because they will be, it's for their future being, so to say. And for our future being at the same time, because they will be embodied in us. And such you we seek with aspiration, Imahe, O Lord, who drips the bright clarity of knowledge, who is himself a shyness of that consciousness, who sees the supramental world, bring here the gods to seize this world for their embodiment. Suvardrisham. Hmm. It's also an interesting word. We, you, we adore, or we want you, we seek you as the one who has the sight or the vision of the Svar world. And it can be both ways, that he sees that what we have to achieve, what we have to realize, to what level we have to rise, or he is also has the sight of that level. He already has the vision of the higher consciousness in himself. I was going to say, because he is that. Yes. He already is that vision of higher consciousness. I mean, he, he is that already. Yes. He is that already, yes. He has that supramental vision. And because of that, he can act so uh, uh, efficiently. I love the vision here that it's co-creative, that, you know, the gods are, they need to come down here for their embodiment. And we need them here to help us um, conquer and get, get over our, all the, all the impediment. You know, we've read this for years already about, you know, asking them to help us get over, you know, to, to, to conquer the obstruction, the obstruction and the dualizing and all of that. We need them to, to, to because 
I mean, wherever we are is already stuck. <laughs> you know, we're all, <laughs> we're yeah, already yeah, totally because of, because of our kind of uh, formation of the species, we are given a particular restricted um, tools. Yeah, like with which we have to create something which is beyond its capacity. So right. in, in this, we feel that our body is not adequate for the consciousness we want to have. And that is the whole evolution which takes place. And we need gods for this, to remold our tools, to refashion our capacities on every level. So when they come, they bring these capacities and we change, we become more and more capable. But we, but they, you know, I love it also that they are invested. They need uh, us for their embodiment. Mm. Right. You know, they need this world. They, right. there's, there's something that they have invested in this world for right. them, for themselves. I mean, it's obvious that we need them. But I love that it's 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 a it's a wet it's a marriage. It's a it's it's a relationship. It's it's right. a love. It's a love affair. Right, right, absolutely. They need us as much as we need them. Right. I love that. I love that vision. That's a Vedic vision. Mm -hmm. really. I mean, you know, you don't see that in a religion. You don't see that in religion. Yes. That, that it's you know mostly we're 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 painted as these kind of sniveling, whining little creatures mm -hmm. that are just you know, begging mm -hmm. for, for uh, God to come fix things for us. Mm -hmm. And, and not that, that it's, uh, that is this is just beautiful, divine, um, co-creative dance um, that helps everybody. There is, uh, yeah, there is something about um, also the gods because they become very personalized and especially in Puranas later, you can see that they become nearly egoistic, nearly like human beings. They have their own, you know, agendas and uh, characters and... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so like Indra, you know, uh, yeah. I, it, sometimes, you know, you see these these yeah. gods with their petul, you know, their, their petulant. petulant. Eyes, yeah. Yeah, anything. Yes, absolutely. And so Mother says about this that if we invoke, for example, the divine or Agni, Agni is not one of the gods, it's quite interesting, or we invoke uh, uh, someone uh, like the divine mother, yeah? Aditi, who is the, the mother of all of them, yeah? and she knows where they are, their functions. So she can provide us the source or the supreme, let us say the supreme you invoke, or the divine mother, she will provide us with with the divine faculties we need for our development. Because if we invoke the wrong God, so to say, with very strong character, we might have um, also difficulties in, in our progress. Because we will pro kind of emphasize one part of ourselves and start using it egoistically for ourselves. So we will be stuck. Well, we'll... we have the, the, perfect, uh, the perfect metaphor for that was created by the great artist Walt Disney. He had a little cartoon, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. I don't know. Oh, but... oh yeah, you've seen that. But uh, it, was a, it was one of his earlier, uh, you know, at, at any rate, this little Mickey Mouse character is uh, mm. the apprentice of the sorcerer with the pointed hat and uh, well, and he's supposed to sweep up, but uh, he uh, applies his novice skills to, to uh, uh, getting the broomstick to do the job, uh, broomstick and pail to do the job on their own. And of course it gets out of hand, uh, becomes a flood. And <laughs> Well, that, you know, that's an interesting thing, too, because that's one of the reasons why um, I, people will often ask me to make them Navrat, Navratna. And, um, you know, I always wonder about that because um, you might be having them all together, but you don't really know whether having all of them empowered in your life is something that would be useful for you or useful for them even you know, having all of them there. You want to, 
honor everybody, but you don't necessarily want to be uh, offering to everybody all at once. Mm. That's why you see now I understand when they invoke Agni, they don't tell him what to do. They they invoke him as the one who knows the procedure, who knows all the births, the, my births. Yeah? He knows what to do with me, what is the best thing. And he will invoke the gods, bring here the gods which are necessary for my development in the most effective way in this moment of time. So that's why Agni is invoked. First. Always. Yeah, first. And then later, once he is already in action, and you see that he brought into activity Indra or Varuna or Mitra, you can um, uh, refer to them directly. But even these Varuna, Mitra, Ryaman, Bhaga, they are very universal godheads. So they should not be harmful to us. Uh, but smaller, smaller creatures, all kind of, you know, um, beings. Angels. Angels. Yeah, yeah, angels, Gandharvas, or these kind of Paishachas. You may get uh, help for some kind of, you know, from creatures, Bhutas of different kind, who could, spirits who could give you some, you know, advantage in the situation, but you will pay to them. It's no. an exchange. So they will do something through you which you don't want. So you will be enslaved by their presence. Yeah, that's a that's a, a that's a a kind of touchy thing. This enslavement, mm -hmm. you know, because there's a there is some value to this of exchanging, which we see in the Veda. I mean, it's in the in the Rig Veda, this mm -hmm. exchange, but it's it's something where, I mean, it's not done with, without your without your willingness. It's mm -hmm. not, you're the one who does the invoking and you do it because, you know, there's a, there's a purpose to it. And when you're dealing with smaller beings, sometimes it's very, they, 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 it's sneaky what they do. Right. It's, 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 it's never free of charge. There is always, there are always strings attached. But the moment you allow this light or the power come in, you have, uh, they come in to, to you as into their home. And then, then you, of course, you will have some advantage in the situation with the other ignorant beings, but inwardly you will be dependent on these forces. And not it's free. something, um, yeah, like a lot of, uh, they, they um, get invoked uh, for the purposes of healing, you know, like, mm -hmm they people have some pain or they have some Lyme disease or something and they they go to these healers and they you know invoke these angels or these spirits or what by judge we don't even know who they are they don't they might not even know who they are yeah. but they'll they'll enact this healing but what people don't ever ever think about is what am i paying for this healing right what will happen next when i am healed uh, have healed and what these creatures will do to me afterwards what should I really give them back for this that's why giving was always very dangerous in the ancient world you saw, because it's imparting part of one's own energy as we spoke about da. Well, is that true for charity? charity Char is considered uh, I mean is done isn't it? I mean it's giving for um, you know, it's one of the upayas and it's one of the ways of improving. Yes, dhanam, yes. But one has to know uh, how to give. And they also say, uh, so, um, bhaya deyam, yes, give with fear. So, um, uh, um, it's aitare, taitere. So you cannot give like this. You have to, how to say? Give with fear, wow. You you have to to know what you are doing. Truly speaking, you cannot, because even if you give some gift to someone, it's very dangerous for you also because you are imparting part of your energy onto the being. It's really a big topic. Maybe even next time we will talk about giving, giving yeah. and why it is not accepted and why it is accepted and how. While oh, do you remember that because that seems very. That seems very important and also 
it, I mean, we have Dakshina is part of the Veda. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's part of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand these things. I think that would be mm -hmm. a very good conversation. And to, to me, I look at it as that you, you have to have it in some kind of balance, the same way that we breathe the air and we consume food, mm -hmm. uh, which, and, you know, we produce the results at the other end. And, uh, we, you know, so, so from that context, uh, um, you know, giving is uh, part, of, par part of what we do. Mm -hmm. But there is such a thing as toxic giving, you know, mm -hmm. the codependency where, you know, then you have someone who is almost like your slave and you're dependent and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they don't, they don't get, you know, they don't get over their neediness or, you know, all of these issues. So, but that's just with humans. I, I'm interested also in augmenting what you just said, Lynn, with an understanding of how the divine, you know, how that can be, um, a problem when it's on a divine level as well. It is very similar on the divine level, but we discuss this uh, uh, next time because the root is to also sacrifice. Sacrifice that means I impart myself, I give, I expand myself, expand my presence. Yeah, I give presence everywhere. That means my being is bigger now. And these people who accepted my presence everywhere, you know, whatever I gave to them, become part of my context, so to say. I live through them, even if they are not thinking about me. There's some something occult expansion is taking place. So it's a very tricky giving. <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to go into that a little more. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah. Of course, you know, in Upaya, you know, when we have. Uh, uh, in Jyotish and when we're training, uh, you, you, you know, you get taught that uh, the, the seva, the dana is the most powerful one. So it's often hard to convince people of that. But um, I have found that sometimes, uh, sometimes the uh, people who uh, finding the, the right magnitude, the right proportion for the situation, sometimes uh, uh, you know, as it says in one um, passage that that um, uh, if a poor man buries a nail, uh, uh, an iron nail on the bridge, it could be extremely powerful under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but I mean, but you, you, you're, you're prescribing for the king and it seems to involve a lot of rubies. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the question is, what's the difference between giving and sacrifice? You know, um, so okay, yeah, more bigger context. Right, right. Okay, let's so, do it next time. Okay, I'm closing with mantra. Uh, rather, he's waiting for me. Om Sarve Bhavanto Sukhinaha Sarve Santo Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyanto Makashit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Love to Radhe. Yes, yes, I will give her love. Your love, thank you. Yeah, bye. Bye. For now. bye.